But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fulfil the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The whole idea of unity uh, in the church has uh, been something that's been on the church's mind, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, We saw the Uniting Church come as a, as, as a church that was going to swallow up all the churches and, all, and the churches would be one. And unfortunately, their common uh, agreement was almost anything and uh, to the point now that if you hold to traditional Christ, Christian teaching in the Uniting Church, you often uh, are troubled by those around you. I, had a, I once knew a, a minister in the Uniting Church who put up a sign out the front of his church that said, uh, this is a Bible-believing, Christ-centred, evangelical, spirit-filled, God-glorifying church, and it was considered by many, both inside and outside the church, as being very controversial and divisive. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, people in, the, in churches have divided over little things, silly things, things that they should never have divided over, things like race or views about baptism or end times or whether or not you should sing songs from the 21st century. Uh, I, I remember. I know people who have who have left a church because a woman took up the offering. Things, little things like that. And uh, in this chapter, chapter four, Paul calls us to hold to those things that are essential and to hold them with a with a tight fist and not waver on them, and 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 not give up on them and and, and hold to those things that the Trinity, the person of God, the gospel, the authority of the Scriptures. We we hold those and we don't waver and we don't compromise. Uh, but other things. We hold with an open hand and we allow disagreements, uh, different songs we like, different uh, views of baptism, different views of the end times, uh, all sorts of things that uh, don't interrupt us fellowshipping together as God's people. Uh, in the first part of chapter 4, Paul has urged unity uh, because th- there's a, an amazing unity in the church because the Jews and the Gentiles are now together as one uh, in, re- in regards to salvation and righteousness the old boundary markers of Jewish identification have been made inconsequential. Uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Uh, what now defines God's people is their commitment to Christ and the distinguishing mark of the Holy Spirit by which God has sealed his own. Uh, it is not merely too an, an, ex, an external unity but a spiritual unity that God's people share. And so in verse 3 of chapter 4, Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. At the same time, it's not an ethereal spiritual vibe with no concern about truth. It's not unity for the sake of unity. It's not unity about anything and everything. Uh, It's unity that's centered on seven ones he gives us in verses 4 to 6. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so Paul's goal is to to bring a unity uh, with lots of different people, but to make sure they're unified and and united about uh, the essentials of the faith, our our Trinitarian God, our great gospel, uh, uh, the baptism that where God brings us in in to be part of his people. And all of these things uh, we're united on. And so God's people have a, div- a diverse background from every tongue and tribe, but a common faith. At the same time, just as we've come from various backgrounds, while, while God transforms and empowers us by his spirit, you notice he doesn't make us all the same. 
I love the diversity evident in this congregation, the different different gifts that there are, and I can only hope that it expands. Uh, but there's an organic unity and that we all work together from a common source and for a common cause to the glory of God alone. Uh, but it's not a static unity, as I've said, that makes us all identical. In case it's not obvious, God gifts us and he energizes us differently. While there is one source, the gifts of God are varied in type and strength. Uh, in uh, Eugene Peterson's translation of this verse, he says, but that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gifts. And so looking at verse 7, if you've got your Bibles with you, I, I encourage you to, to just follow along because we, we want what we say to come from God's word. And he says there, to each one of us, that is each one of us here, uh, this is not talking about each person in the world in general, but to the church in particular, to each genuine follower of Jesus in the Ephesian church, to each Christian in the church today, to each person committed to Christ and worshipping together, this is what he says of them. Grace has been given. And it's worth stressing that Paul says to each one of us, uh, there's not the haves and the have-nots, the spiritually elite and the spiritually deprived. Uh, to each one of us, grace has been given. Uh, I've said before that grace has two main aspects in the Bible. There's this idea of grace being undeserved love. Someone's taken the letters of grace and said, God's riches at Christ's expense. Undeserved love, undeserved forgiveness and mercy. But there's another use of the word grace you find in the scriptures, and you find it often, and, and it's the enabling power, the enabling anointing. It's an undeserved and unexpected uh, move of God on people to empower them uh, for a particular task or a particular ministry. Uh, Paul has spoken of the former grace, the undeserved love, as regards to salvation, and he now moves on to the empowering aspect of grace, an undeserved gift. Uh, the word for grace in the Greek is charis, charis, from which we get the word charismatic. Uh, who is charismatic, you might ask? Well, according to Paul, each one of us, because each one of us has been gifted, and that means spiritually gifted. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, we see also that not only are all God's people baptized in the Holy Spirit, but consequently they are gifted. And if we are obedient to God's word through Paul, we not only follow the way of love, but chapter 14, verse 1, we eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit in our own lives and in the life of the church. And we believe God gives us these gifts to be fanned into flame and to be use, useful at, to bless the body of Christ, the church. Uh, it's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, sometimes God's gifts work in tandem with our abilities and strengths, but other times against them so that the source of God's spirit can be clearly seen. Uh, so, if, so I'm someone who's not medically trained, and if I happen to pray for someone to be healed and God answers that prayer with miraculous healing, as has happened a number of times, then there's no doubt about where the power is coming from. They don't say, well, maybe Tony is secretly a trained physician. Uh, we say God has answered our prayer. Uh, there's a number of people who normally stutter and stumble in their speech, but when they speak for God, they can preach a firestorm and draw a crowd. Uh, I remember when I was in New Zealand, the leader of Youth for Christ New Zealand was such a man who ordinarily would stammer and stutter when he spoke, and then God called him surprisingly to speak for him, and he became a recognized leader across the country, known as a powerful and clear speaker of God's truth. I'm sure many of you have experienced times when you speak with a knowledge and a wisdom far greater than what you would ordinarily normally have. Uh, just the right verse comes to mind or the penetrating question that unlocks uh, an, an issue, a demonic stronghold, and helps release a person from bondage. Uh, we, we say that this could only be God at work in us, uh, and we give God rightly the glory when he helps us in our ministering to one and serving one another. Uh, unfortunately, there is this teaching in the Christian church that not only is our salvation ultimately up to us, but also what gifts we, we have, what gifts we have uh, are entirely up to us. Uh, I, I like 
a lot of the Alpha course, but one thing I didn't like in the Alpha course was the teaching that if anyone wants the gift of tongues, they can have it. And uh, it, was a, it was a teaching that was very prevalent when I was growing up. Uh, I remember as a young person, I went up the front to get the gift of tongues because I was told if you wanted it, you can have it, and who wouldn't want a gift from God? So I went up seven times, I think, to get the gift of tongues and uh, came back empty-handed in regards to that particular gift. I had all sorts of other gifts, but that was the gift I was told was offered, and we could tell God what we wanted, and and he had to give it to us. Uh, I was told to pray banana backwards and and uh, speak gobbledygook, and that would finally come, and it, and it never did. And, and, and I was uh, an elder in the church in New Zealand uh, in my 20s, and a, a lady from the uh, who was in charge of prayer for the church came to our congregation, and she said to me, uh, do you speak in tongues? And I sheepishly said no. And she said, I'll pray for you tomorrow and you'll receive it. And I thought, oh, here we go again. And I went home desperate to understand after so many attempts why this time was I going to receive the gift. Could she really determine what gifts we would receive? And I read the Bible's teaching on this gift again. And then everything was settled. Everything was sorted with just one verse, and indeed just one phrase. It's found in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, on the subject of gifts, where Paul is trying to say we don't all have the same gifts. We're not all feet. We're not all the same. We all have different gifts. I love this verse, verse 11. All these are works of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Of course I realize it's not up to me, it's not up to her, but up to God, and he distributes just as he determines. It's not rocket science. This is a gift. You don't take a gift, you receive it. You don't determine a gift, you discover it just as he determines. And that's exactly what God says here. To each one of God's people, grace, curse, gifts have been given, not as we determine, but as it says in verse 7, as Christ apportions it as Christ apportions it. We don't demand it. We don't earn it. We don't decide it. It is Christ who determines what is given and even how much is given. Uh, We leave the results to him. He distributes it based on his own purposes and the needs of the church. And it doesn't mean we cannot or shouldn't desire. Uh, It doesn't mean we shouldn't ask for more gifts and more power in the gifts we have. We are, Paul tells us, to eagerly desire them and to fan them into flame and and to, to, to become mature in our use of them. Paul has said to Timothy and the entire Corinthian church these things, to fan them into flame and to be, be mature and to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. And, and you find this teaching all over the Scriptures. You find it again in Romans 12. Let me read to you from Romans 12, verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given To each of us, not according to what we want, not according to what we ask for, but according to God's grace to us. And if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. And if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We serve according to the grace given to us. And so this is how the church is to function, the body of Christ ministering and serving to one another in the the different different gifts that we have. Uh, Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. The fact is that as we read the scriptures, we see a number of of accounts that describe the body of Christ as being all believers made up of many distinctive parts. But in reality, and certainly historically, we've often seen the church, at least traditionally, as one man leading, surrounded by a few elders at his side, and everyone else is considered the audience. Uh, that doesn't sound like a multi-gifted serving body of Christ, but a, more like a one-man band with a few sidekicks. Um, and some legitimately say, well, I don't know what my spiritual gifts are, so how can I act on it? Uh, sometimes people do surveys and questionnaires to get an idea about the spiritual gifts that they, they, they might have. But often these surveys won't reveal the gifts that are not being used. Uh, So why is the actual church often so different from the biblical descriptions of the church? And even in mega churches, and there are exceptions to this, you have more ministers and ministries, but due to size, you have even more people hanging around the edges, not ministering, and able to hide in the crowd. Uh, On this subject, I I really found it 
freeing uh, what uh, Ref reform theologian Sam Storm says on this. And he says this, listen to these words. He says, instead of trying to find out your gift, let your gift find you. In other words, instead of waiting uh, till you know your gifts before you serve, how about you serve and find out where you are gifted? Uh, and he gives some really helpful examples. He says, the next time you're in church or in a small group or just hanging out with other believers, pause momentarily and ask, is anyone physically hurt or suffering from chronic pain? If so, take your hands out of your pockets, lay them on your brother or sister and pray for God's healing power. Is any of you distraught or discouraged? Are some, of, are some finding life too frustrating to bear? If so, take them out for a cup of coffee and listen to their story. You don't have to theologize about their predicament. They're not looking for explanations. They just want someone who cares enough to spend a few minutes with them. Just listen to them, then love them. Is anyone struggling financially with a few prospects to get them out, with, with very few prospects to get them out of the hole they're in? Uh, do something courageous. Give them your last $50 and trust God to supply your need. Is anyone confused about some verse of scripture they just read in their devotional time? Perhaps you're just as befuddled as they are. Pull out a concordance, a study Bible, perhaps a commentary and study together. Then sit down with your friend and put your heads and hearts together and pray for the Spirit to give you understanding. Is anyone struggling with sin? Offer to pray for them. But before you do, sit quietly together and ask the Lord to guide your thoughts and speak words of wisdom to your soul. If you sense something or a thought comes to mind, share it with them. It might be the key that opens the door to their hearts and brings freedom from bondage. Does the person you just prayed for report hearing voices in their head? Do they struggle with paralyzing shame, virtually bombarded on a daily basis by accusing thoughts and self-contempt? If so, speak the word of God over them with authority. In the name of Christ, command any oppressive demonic spirit to leave and never return. Pray for them to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Is anyone over overwhelmed by the clutter in the garage and that ever-increasing mountain of dirty laundry? Offer to spend Saturday with them, helping out, picking up, washing, drying, folding, and putting away clothes. You get the idea. Now, none of that sounds especially spectacular. Well, well, maybe some of it does, but uh, that 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 we're aiming. You can see what's been aimed at here. Simply, this is what it means. If we spend less time searching to identify our spiritual gifts and more time actually praying and giving and helping and teaching and serving and exhorting those around us, the likelihood great, greatly increases that we will walk headlong into our gifting without ever knowing what happened. So instead of trying to discover our gift, our gift finds us. And God will more likely meet us with his gifts in the midst of trying to help his children than he ever would while we're trying to do a spiritual gift analysis test. Uh, so look for a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Be alert to the cry for help and answer it. Listen for the voice of God and speak it. Identify someone's weakness and overcome it. Look for what's missing and supply it. And when you do, the power of God, the energizing, enabling, charismatic activity of the Holy Spirit will equip you, perhaps only once but possibly forever, to minister hope and encouragement to those in need. And if you're moving in faith and looking for God to supply, then it will be he that gets, gets the glory uh, when he does. And so just serve one another. Look around you and, and serve and bless one another and you will find uh, where you are gifted. And so to illustrate this now, Paul turns in verse 8 to the Old Testament and he, he finds in, in an Old Testament verse, uh, in, in a chapter in the Old Testament, a picture of Christ as he gifts and blesses his church. He quotes here from Psalm 68, verse 18. Uh, and, and he quotes this verse, which says there, when you ascend on high, you took many captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. And Paul now applies this psalm to Jesus. And so he begins in verse 8, when he ascends on high. And the psalm speaks of God ascending and reigning from a high mountain. Paul applies this to Christ's triumphal ascension when he was lifted up into the heavens. And by citing the psalm, Paul puts the Lord Jesus Christ 
into that role, the same role as God, and affirms that he is God, affirms his deity. Psalm 68 celebrates God's triumphant march from Mount Sinai in the wilderness to Mount Zion in Jerusalem and his enthronement there. And Paul regards this as prefiguring Christ's victorious ascent into heaven. Jesus predicted his own ascension. Luke 22:69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And here in this psalm, Paul sees Christ in his full ascension, ascended on high, ascended to the cross as the King of the Jews, ascended to earth as resurrected Savior, ascended to heaven as victorious Lord and great high priest, sitting at the right hand of the Father as reigning King. The next part says he took many captives. And this psalm refers to defeated kings and alludes to the defeated powers arrayed against God and his anointed. And the allusion is to a triumphal procession in which uh, are marched the captives taken in war. Who are these captives? Surely the spiritual demonic powers Christ conquered by the cross. Uh, the best explanation for the identity of these warriors, says biblical commentator Clinton Arnold, is that Christ has defeated the principalities, powers, and authority. Jesus defeated the spiritual powers arrayed against God and God's people, and he describes it in places in the Bible, like Colossians 2.15, that says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now the powers of evil have been held back and bound, so they are no longer able to hold back the gospel from going into all the world. Since the time of Christ, we see the gospel going out to every corner. God's people are no longer a nation. The identity of God's people has indeed gone global. Uh, there is no doubt about who's in charge now. Peter describes it in, in his letter. He says of Christ, Jesus, as the one who has gone into heaven, and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And so you may feel weak and oppressed by spiritual powers, but you can call on the one who has authority over those powers, the one who is above uh, those demonic powers, and you can call on that God, uh, that great Christ who is victor and, and the one who is above all, and you can call on him for help. Christ ascended on high. He took many captives and he gave gifts to his people. And holding on to this idea of, the, of taking uh, kings captive and receiving the spoils, Jesus distributes gifts to his people. Uh, there's a variant here in the Old Testament verse being quoted. Many ma manuscripts speak of, of uh, the, victorious kings, the victorious king receiving gifts and the spoils of war. Uh, but a few translations like the Aramaic speak here of the king giving gifts. And it's really not such a, a contradiction uh, because uh, the, the winner of, of the battle receives the spoils of war and then distributes them. Uh, we can think of the, the triumphant divine warrior who after he ascends to the throne receives gifts of homage from his captives and then divides out or shares the spoils of war. And for Paul, this depicts Christ as the triumphant divine warrior who after he ascends to his throne blesses his people with gifts, and, uh, and particularly here, spiritual gifts. Uh, just as the victorious warriors seized and divides the spoils, so Christ, imprisoning the forces of evil and winding back their hold on the world, goes on to gift his people for the work ahead in his coming and growing kingdom. And then Paul hones in on that verse in verses 9 and 10, and he looks first of all at the descent of Christ and then the, uh, the ascent. He hones in and expands of the, of the, on the vertical direction of Christ's travels. And he starts by saying, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended? For Christ to ascend means he must have descended. Christ, whose home is in heaven with the Father, must have descended to be able to ascend back there. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but it's not really that difficult. Christ's ascension, or as, as we sometimes call it, his humiliation, could also be described as his incarnation. Christ descending to earth is not just being dropped with a parachute out of a plane. It's vastly more eventful than that. Uh, you remember Isaiah prayed that God would, would rend the heavens and come down. 
Uh, that indeed is what Jesus has done to the lower earthly regions, uh, Paul says. Uh, this is likely not talking about a descent into the underworld or Hades, but to the drudgery of living as an earthling. Uh, the ESV translates this, this verse, uh, he ascended. What does it mean? That he also, but he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. Uh, think about the vast distance between Christ's heavenly existence and landing on earth as one of us, even a baby. Think of his incarnation when he took on a human nature here in the lower regions of the earth. Uh, Jesus' suffering was not just the cross, uh, but about the infinite staircase between heaven and earth with each downward step painful. Uh, we get a mini picture of this. Do you remember that time in the in the Gospels when it's the transfiguration and, and Jesus is on a mountain and and he's joined by great prophets from the Old Testament and, and he and he lights up and there's that moment of glory and, and it's almost like they're, they're they're in heaven. And then they come down the mountain and at the bottom of the mountain is a is a demonic a man who's possessed by demons and the disciples can't uh, exorcise him. And 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 Jesus is visibly frustrated. He says, "How long must I put up, put up with you?" And you get the sense of the the transition from one great glorious place to the reality of what's happening down at the foot of the mountain is quite jarring. Imagine what it was like for Jesus to come from heaven, worshipped by angels, and 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 come into this earth as a baby, and to be spat on by men, the very ones he created. Uh, and it's an amazing thing that Jesus, who lived in heaven, would condescend to being transformed by adding humanity to his divine purpose and come to live with us as one of us. And the final step of Jesus' humiliation was, of course, his torturous death on the cross and his burial. Jesus tasted death so we ultimately didn't have to. And uh, I love how Hebrews describes it. It says, We see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus came down into a, to such a low point that he actually took our sin upon himself and took our punishment so that we could be raised up with him. And, and so verse 10 now comes to the exaltation. He turns to the other side of the coin in the ascension of Christ. He who descended, Paul says, is the very one who ascended. Jesus came down, but he didn't stay down. Even as he set out for the cross, heaven was in the foreground. And after his resurrection and many appearances, he was taken up to heaven in glory. Uh, and again, the writer of the Hebrews reminds us, uh, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we, pro we profess. Uh, if the one who follow we follow has ascended to the highest place after his great suffering, then we who follow him can also rest in him, knowing there is nothing higher than our Lord, that whatever we go through, we are following the one who is in heaven. And Paul emphasized this. He says Christ is now higher than all the heavens. There's simply nothing and no one higher. His ascension is higher than the sky. It is higher than the heavens. There is no one who is pure and no one raised higher. His place is above all. And it not only, not only reminds us that nothing can conquer him, but also that ex in that exalted place, he is worthy of our worship. As Psalm 148 puts it, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for the, his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And then finally we see the goal, in order to fill the whole universe. From the very beginning, God is is a filling God who fills everything with his glory. He fills the heavens with his glory, with the sun and the stars. He fills the sky with his glory, with the birds. Uh, he, he fills the sea with his glory, with the fish and the land, with spreading beauty and goodness. He fills these empty spaces with his glory. He's made us in his image and he's commanded that the earth be filled with his image bearers. And Habakkuk 2.14 says the earth will be filled with, with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, and ultimately the whole universe will cry out and, and, and proclaim that Christ is Lord. Uh, we've already seen this in, this in this book, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. 
God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so in conclusion, can I invite you to come to this Christ, to seek him first in all that you do, to acknowledge that he is the one that is high above all, and to make use of the gifts that he gives us uh, in ministry, in service to one another and to the world. And remember that Paul reminds us the reign of Christ is greater than we can imagine, that the ripple breaking into the universe like a larger star whose light keeps traveling is, is spreading and will fill the entire universe. Let us pray. Father, we only have a glimpse. We can only imagine what it means when the glory of Christ is, is uh, saturating the whole universe. We see your glory in what you have made. We see your glory in your transforming power uh, in your people. And we see your glory spreading. And we see evidences of your, of your spirit at work. Father, we thank you that you didn't just save us, but you, you filled us and gave us your Holy Spirit and you gifted us that we might better uh, represent you, that we might better serve you, and that we might spread your glory. May we be people who are moving to that end uh, when Christ fills the whole universe, when your glory is over, over this earth as the, as the waters cover the sea. Lord, start with us. Help us to be your image bearers and your glory spreaders. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.